Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome uh, to today's webinar. You know, it's a holiday today, and Eid Mubarak uh, to all those who are celebrating. And thank you for your time uh, to come and attend this, and we're sure we're going to make it uh, worth it because it's a very, very interesting topic. And uh, we're going to talk today about digital therapeutics and that too in cardiovascular disease. So we've seen and heard a lot about digital therapeutics coming up uh, in diabetes, in mental health and other disorders. And cardiovascular disease, another space where you know, it can help uh, clinicians and cardiologists to save time as well as get better outcomes for patients, uh, build healthy habits in their patients, and again, do this in a very, very scientific way. Uh, to help uh, learn more about this topic. Today, we have with us uh, Dr. Vivek Baliga from Bengaluru, uh, who is a very, very patient-centric uh, physician and cardiologist. And uh, within the medical community, we always talk about, you know, early adopters and legats. And uh, not many of us, you know, as doctors are ingrained to trust technology so much. But uh, Dr. Baliga is definitely an exception who has been an early adopter, understands you know, what is uh, the best technology and how it can support uh, him in his practice and give better outcomes. So uh, without further ado, I hand it over to Dr. Uh Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about dig dig digital therapeutics, in, uh, especially for cardiovascular disease. Now, we have seen uh, medicine and cardiovascular disease uh, growing leaps and bounds over the last uh, decade or so. And for after COVID, uh, I think everybody has been looking at a lot of uh, home-based treatments rather than having to visit a clinic. The whole dynamic of uh, medical care has changed. Online consultations became uh, the norm now in most patients. And now, even with the post-ACS um, or post-heart failure admissions, we have been using uh, digital therapeutics as a part of our treatment strategy to help not only improve outcomes, but also to answer questions that patients have, uh, which they would normally call us about. But when we have a team that handles it all, it life becomes a lot, lot easier for us and we can concentrate on what we wish to do. So without uh, further ado, I would like to just quickly share my screen. The topic for uh, discussion today is digital therapeutics in cardiovascular disease. Uh, next slide, please. So cardiovascular disease is a very common problem. In India, face, uh, we see a fair amount of uh, not just uh, heart attacks and uh, heart failures, but also a lot of hypertension and other risk factors for cardiovascular disease, such as diabetes and dyslipidemia. So one in four deaths uh, within the country and or globally are due to cardiovascular disease. And over the last 10 years, there's been a, a, a doubling in the cardiovascular mortality that has been noted through uh, various studies. Next slide. So when it comes to uh, the risk factors for cardiovascular disease, there are uh, broadly classified as non-modifiable and modifiable risk factors. So the non-modifiable ones are age, uh, gender, genetic factors, race, and ethnicity. So we know that as we get a little older, the risk of uh, heart disease increases. Gender, most commonly males are affected more frequently than females, but that is probably also because women don't get themselves tested that frequently. As a result, the uh, I feel the uh, amount of or the, the what uh, prevalence we see of cardiovascular disease is a lot lesser in women or a lot less reported. Genetic factors play a very strong role. And in practice, we get a lot of patients coming to us who have no risk factors in the sense that they have no high blood pressure, no diabetes, no history of smoking, normal cholesterol, but they have a very strong family history of cardiovascular disease. Say their father, mother, brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, all of them have cardiac disease. And these patients as well develop heart disease at a very young age. Race and ethnicity play an important factor. But what uh, matters most is the modifiable risk factors. So looking at things like obesity, high blood pressure, a history of current or ex-smokers, high cholesterol, diabetes, and a sedentary lifestyle. So one, uh, if we manage to control one of these factors, we can break the cycle of cardiovascular disease and over a period of time, reduce the um, overall incidence of it and improve outcomes as well. Next slide, please. 
So when you're looking at uh, blood pressure management itself, uh, one of the most uh, things I one of the common things I tell my patients is that uh, if you're sitting in the waiting room, look around you, and at least if there are ten people there, at least three of them have got high blood pressure. So nearly one in three uh, of uh, Indians have got high blood pressure. And if you look at the physicians' perspectives, um, and this was a, a questionnaire, what they found was that uh, most of the patients had not improved their diet when they're looking to treat their blood pressure. Uh, there is low treatment motivation because these patients feel absolutely fine. Uh, even patients who have a 200 blood pressure come saying that they're feeling quite okay and they're quite surprised and they always put down their BP to being because of being in a doctor's clinic and not because it is true hypertension, which is a big problem. Uh, with uh, more and more working hours, working from home has actually make it a lot, made it a lot more stressful for patients. Even the living environments uh, are no longer better. And there are numerous other uh, factors that lead to at least 80% of the patients not being at a target blood pressure. So when we talk about digital therapeutics, what we're looking at is uh, trying to target each of these uh, particular factors, which is something that cannot be done in a 10 or 15 minute consultation that is held in a clinic. All of this requires constant motivation. It requires constant uh, watching of the patient, constant discussion with the patient, answering any queries that they may have, so all this is where digital therapeutics has a, a very important role. Next slide, please. So to define what digital therapeutics is, uh, the first thing, the term was used for the first time in 2015 in a, in a paper that was published in, uh, uh, by Sepa and Yang, uh, where they mentioned digital therapeutics and defined it as evidence-based behavioral treatments delivered online that can increase accessibility and effectiveness of healthcare. So this is a very, very important part of healthcare now. It's not just about what we do in the clinic, but what happens in the community as well. And since then, there has been the Digital Therapeutics Alliance, which defines uh, digital therapeutics as delivering evidence-based therapeutic interventions to patients that are driven by software to prevent, manage, or treat a medical disorder or disease. And they are used independently or in concert with medications, devices, or other therapies to optimize patient care and health outcomes. So with such a long definition, you would imagine that there is definitely a, a big area uh, that is uh, there to be discussed. So we'll talk about uh, what exactly digital therapeutics is now. Next slide, please. So if you're talking about how it can manage cardiovascular disease, uh, take, for example, any digital therapeutics company, the common um, the problems that we face as medical professionals is very busy outpatient department. There'll be a long list of patients waiting to be seen on time. It's not possible to spend enough time with patients to address each and every uh, concern that they have, which, makes it, which means that we have lesser time to, time to counsel our patients. In addition to this, there is a lack of resources for guiding patients on non-pharmacological treatment. So what we mean by this is that uh, things such as what to eat, they will have tons of questions about what fruits they can have, what diet they can follow after a heart problem, how much liquid they can have, whether they can eat, drink buttermilk, whether they can drink tender coconut, so many things that they, they have questions on that is not possible for us to spend uh, time with explaining. Furthermore, uh, we usually give patients a follow-up in about three to four months. And during that time when they are at home, they're not really aware of what they're doing and whether they're following the advice in the right way or not. And as a result of the uh, sort of lack of continuity in care, um, I think patients end up having suboptimal patient outcomes. So the key targets is to see whether we can address uh, the lack of structured guidance on disease management, address an aspect where patients are following unscientific non-validated fads. This is very, very common. Uh, address the fact that they are not motivated enough to adhere to lifestyle changes and see what measures can be put into place to ensure that they follow the measures and to finally try and reduce the risk of complications. So this is the, the foundation on which uh, digital therapeutics is built. Next, please. So if you're looking at uh, it as a holistic solution, uh, you're talking about numerous aspects of uh, care of patients. So one of that is nutrition, which is a digital, digital approach to nutrition, looking at a scientific behavioral change strategies, looking at physiotherapy intervention and pain management. An important thing that you're looking at is stress and sleep management, which is probably the most important thing after nutrition. Community support is essential because patients sometimes feel very alone uh, in, their, in their whole journey 
of healthcare. They have people around them who, of course, support them, their family, love and care for them, but they don't understand what they go through. And, and you need a team that can help them understand what exactly they're going through, maybe connect them with other patients who are going through the same thing so that they don't feel left alone. And finally, uh, a portal where doctors themselves can see how their patients are doing. So a, a dashboard for the doctors. Next slide, please. So the American Heart Association has got life's essential eight checklists for cardiovascular disease. So these are crucial measures for improving and maintaining cardiovascular health. It is very simple. It is something that we all, but it is sometimes important to reiterate this advice. So the first thing is to eat heart healthy food. Next is to exercise regularly, quit tobacco, try and get quality sleep of at least six to seven hours a night, maintain a body mass index within the optimal limit, Keep your cholesterol under control, control blood sugar and control blood pressure. So essentially you're addressing all the risk factors that can lead to uh, cardiovascular disease. Next slide, please. So if you're talking about heart healthy food consumption, uh, there are 10 key features that the AHA has presented. This uh, we have to bear in mind that this is catered towards a Caucasian audience. So in India, the dietary habits are quite different. So we have to go by our experience, but end of the day, the principles remain the same. So you're looking at balancing food and calorie. This is extremely important uh, in certain parts of our country, even especially in South India, where I hail from, the calorie intake of food is extremely high because the primary staple of uh, what we eat is rice. And rice is a very high calorie food. Potatoes are a very high calorie food. Sugar and sweets are high calorie foods. Processed foods such as maida, these are high calorie foods. And if you take in a lot of high calorie foods, you cause a lot of inflammation within the body. And inflammation is the first step that leads to uh, fat deposits within the heart arteries. So it's in, it is important to balance food and calorie intake. That is one. The next thing is making sure that you consume uh, fresh fruits and vegetables every day rather than popping in a pill. See, pills can be advertised abroad, but within India, we are not allowed to advertise medication or supplements per se, though it does happen. But what we need to remember is that nature has given us so many fruits and vegetables that we can just rely on those to give us all the vitamins and minerals that we need. We don't really need to take in pills all the time. In my practice, I, uh, when young patients ask me whether they should be taking a vitamin supplement, my answer is a resounding no. Because if it is an elderly patient with a poor appetite who is not able to eat or who is frail, then yes, giving them vitamin supplements makes some sense. But younger patients can manage by just their diet. And patients who have cardiovascular disease or those who are looking, looking, looking to lower their risk, those patients as well would benefit more from the fruits and vegetables because of the fiber that is present in that, which is something that we forget. We always think that fresh fruits and vegetables only contain vitamins and minerals, but fiber is an important part of our habits. Uh, soluble fiber has been known to reduce cholesterol levels and to improve overall cardiovascular well-being. So consuming fruits as a whole or vegetables as a whole is very good, better than supplements. The third point is to choose whole grains over refined flour. Now, maida tastes great. We all know white bread is, is uh, amazing to eat. A sandwich with white bread is, is delicious. But end of the day, you're harming your body with that. So you can choose whole grains. When you talk about whole grains, you're talking about whole wheat. You're talking about uh, millets. You're talking about semolina or rava, as we call it. Uh, you're talking about oats. These are all whole grain foods that have a lower glycemic index. So what they do is they reduce sugar spikes within the body and they're also very rich in fiber. So these things can overall help in cardiovascular disease, stroke and coronary artery disease. As a part of your plate, the food that you serve, uh, you know, put, your, put, your, put your food on, it's important not only to include all these whole grains and foods, etc., but also to include protein. Now, protein is essential for muscle health. The more muscle mass you have, the healthier you are. And without protein, there cannot be any enzyme growth, the enzyme uh, uh, formation in the body. You need proteins for hair growth. You need proteins to keep your skin strong, your bones strong, your muscles strong. So it's required for almost everything in the body. So it's important that you choose lean or high fiber proteins such as legumes. If you are a non-vegetarian eater, you can choose uh, things like lean meat like fish and chicken or even whole eggs are perfectly fine. With regards to using oils, uh, using non-tropical plant oils such as olive oil and sunflower oil is good. If you, Because Indians cook at a high heat, we usually recommend using mixed oils because such as a combination of olive and sunflower oil or uh, sunflower oil and rapeseed oil because 
these don't degenerate at a higher temperature when you're cooking at a high temperature they don't oils don't break down and and create a lot of toxic elements they actually remain stable and you'll get the nutrients in the sense that you'll get the polyunsaturated fatty acids and the monounsaturated fatty acids more and cooking at a lower temperature uh, is always better than cooking at a higher temperature uh, next slide please So point number six is to eat minimally processed foods rather than ultra processed foods as much as possible. Because studies have found that those people who eat low carbohydrate and low fat diet can naturally lower their blood pressure by around five millimeter systolic and three diastolic in six months. When I talk about ultra processed foods, I'm talking about mostly refined flour based foods like biscuits, white bread, um, things like uh, chocolate, sweets, etc. Anything made with processed as well should be avoided. Of course, it's a, a well-known thing that we should be avoiding beverages and foods with added sugars. Uh, believe it or not, a can of any soft drink has got nearly 16 spoons of sugar in it. So you can imagine the amount of stress that it's causing to your body. You might feel good, but your body doesn't actually like it. Uh, limiting sodium intake. Now, sodium is notorious at increasing blood pressure and patients who have high blood pressure should be limiting their sodium intake as much as possible. Uh, sodium is in all types of salt, even if you're looking at pink salt as well, the sodium content is almost similar to that of uh, salt we use. So it doesn't matter which salt you use, as long as you use very little of it, uh, don't uh, put added salt on the side. We have a habit of having like in South India, we have curd rice with salt in it or buttermilk with salt in it. All these sort of things should be, you know, try and cut it down and avoid it as much as possible. So if you keep your sodium intake to around 1500 milligrams a day, then you'll be, your, your heart will thank you, your body will thank you. Uh, alcohol consumption as well should be limited. If you are someone who doesn't drink alcohol, just don't avoid it completely. Even if you enjoy alcohol, keep it to a limit because uh, studies have found that uh, with uh, regular alcohol intake, you can increase your heart by 5.8 beats per minute. Now, a high resting heart rate has been associated with a poor outcome when it comes to heart health because I always give the anecdote of a horse uh, running versus a horse walking. If you have a horse walking, the horse can walk for miles on end without any problem. But if you have a horse running, eventually the horse will get tired. So if your heart is beating at a faster rate, actually it'll get a lot, lot tired, it'll get diseased, it'll get weak. But if the heart is beating nice and slowly, that is through exercise and through good diet, then the heart will carry on for a lot longer. So it is important, uh, while all these points are all well and good, uh, these points apply even if you're at home or at work or even on holiday. So make sure you follow these guidelines wherever you go, uh, no matter where the food is prepared or consumed. Next slide, please. Now we come to exercise. Exercise, the current recommendation by the American Heart Association is at least 150 minutes of moderate aerobic exercise per week or 75 minutes of vigorous aerobic exercise per week or a combination of both. Now, in a sense, if you want to divide it into a five, you can say 30 minutes of exercise a day. That doesn't seem like much, but this, this as I said, like, as I earlier mentioned, a lot of the guidelines are catering towards the Caucasian populations, not towards Indians. So in India, I usually advise patients at least 45 minutes to an hour because of the way we eat and the, the environmental factors we have to face compared to the Caucasian population. When you talk about moderate aerobic uh, intensity exercise, moderate intensity exercise, you're talking about an exercise that makes you feel breathless at the end of it. So if, for example, you go for a walk and if you're going with your friends and just having a chit chat, that's not really counted as exercise. That will just be counted as physical activity. But if you go for a walk and it's a brisk, dedicated walk and you do 30, 45 minutes of that, at the end of it, if you have difficulty speaking in a sentence, that means the exercise has been a good quality exercise. And this is the exercise that really your heart will thank you for. So aerobic exercise uses aerobic metabolism. So it uses a lot of oxygen and it extracts energy into the, in the muscles mainly, and we call it low to moderate intensity physical activities. But if, you're, if, uh, if you do aerobic exercises, what you are doing in the long term is you're lowering cholesterol, you're helping the heart become a little stronger. In patients after a heart attack or if they have reduced heart function, you're actually pumping the heart in such a way that it does become stronger and its efficiency improves. When it comes to diabetes, the insulin resistance improves and uh, better insulin resistance means that there is better blood glucose levels. So the lesser the medication is required for patients to exercise. And finally, there is an improvement in endothelial function. And briefly, the endothelium is a, 
are lining a single line of cells that lines all our blood vessels. And these cells respond to stresses. So if, for example, if you have high blood pressure or you have a poor diet, etc., these cells don't function normally and they have a property of releasing something called nitric oxide. This nitric oxide is to relax the blood vessels so the blood pressure remains nice and low and your body remains very calm. But when you're putting in stresses and processed food and not exercising and gaining weight and smoking, etc., you're damaging the endothelial cells. And the endothelial cell damage leads to poor function. And this is what ultimately leads to blockages in the arteries and heart attacks. Now, anaerobic exercise also should be a part of your regime. This is high intensity training, including sprinting and powerlifting. But kindly remember, this is not for everyone. Before you take up anything like high intensity training, it is important to get clearance from your doctor that you can do so. Some people decide one day to lift weights and they end up with injuries or muscle tears or even have collapsed in the gym. So it is not the way to do it. Talk to your doctor, talk about a plan on how you can build up your exercise over a period of months to eventually reach a high intensity goal. So anaerobic exercises have found to have positive influences on body mass indexes and blood pressure. And in some cases, it demonstrates better results in the cardiovascular system compared to low intensity training. What my advice would be is to combine both high and low intensity training in your regime, but do it with the guidance of a trainer or a team that manages through digital therapeutics, because they will be able to tell you exactly what you can and cannot do based on your profile. So don't do it. Uh, don't decide to just go to the gym and run on the treadmill. It doesn't work like that. Start baby footsteps and then gradually build up over a period of time. Next slide, please. Now, tobacco is a hazard. We know that smoking is linked to about a third of cardiovascular disease and about 90% of lung cancers. And in the US, the statistics are staggering uh, in that 40% of children uh, between the ages of 3 to 11 are exposed to secondhand smoke. Now, studies have found, and particularly a prospective study looking at over 1 lakh, nearly 1 lakh 90,000 patients revealed that 36 most common uh, of the 36 uh, most common specific cardiovascular types, event rates for 29 of them were increased in, uh, significantly in smokers. What this basically means is that people who smoke have a higher chance of developing a heart attack. Simple as that. And 20, over 20 individual level studies pointed out that there is a 20 to 30 percent increased risk of stroke amongst passive smokers. So if you have a smoker at home, and they are, you're inhaling the smoke that they are you know, uh, puffing out when they're smoking, you have a higher risk of developing heart attacks. So it's important to just get rid of that cigarette habit completely. Next, please. Now, sleep is something that uh, we all struggle with because of our, uh, I guess now it's because of the weather that we have, but um, sometimes it is because of the stresses that we have and uh, you know the mental stress that we have, it is difficult to fall asleep sometimes. But studies have repeatedly shown that if you sleep for at least seven to nine hours a night, that you can maintain good heart health. Those people who lead busy lifestyles, I always tell them to at least lead, have seven hours of sleep, not six, not five, but seven hours minimum sleep. Because remember that you've put your body through an onslaught through the day. You need to give it enough time to reset. And six hours is not at all. So seven hours is important. So a study that looked at nearly 61,000 patients age 40 or older pointed Participants sleeping, sleeping less than six hours daily had a higher risk of coronary artery disease. And for uh, sleep quality, both dreamy sleep and difficulty in falling asleep and the use of sleeping pills or drugs were related to enhanced heart disease risk. Uh, so essentially what uh, these studies have found is that those people who don't sleep well are, are at a higher risk of developing cardiovascular disease. Next, please. Now, weight management is a crucial part of uh, keeping your heart health and your brain health uh, secure. Uh, the, while the AHA states to keep the healthy BMI range between 18.5 to 24.9, Indians are built a little differently. The BMI that we have to maintain, ideal BMI is within 23, and 25 is actually considered obese in India. So if you are, uh, your body mass index is essentially your weight in kilograms divided your height in meters squared. So you can just check your height, put your weight into a software, and there's a definitely enough number of calculators online, and you can check what your BMI is. If you're keeping a BMI between, say, 19 to 23, your BMI or body mass index is a pretty healthy one. But it is not the best way to check uh, how healthy you are because bodybuilders have a higher BMI. Uh, waist to hip index is something else that can be used sometimes, but we'll not talk about it. 
So if you are, are in a higher BMI group, you should be looking at losing weight. So weight loss is a simple uh, what is a formula. First is what you put in versus what you burn. So if you put in more and you burn less, then whatever extra you put in becomes weight. If you put in less and you burn more, you will get, lose weight. So it's as simple as that. So you need to be calorie conscious. So you'll need to ideally talk to a nutritionist who can tell you about what it is you're eating. And they can also guide you and the exercise therapist uh, can guide you on how you can burn more calories than what you're eating. So if you reduce calories and increase your physical activity, you'll be burning more calories. So essentially, you'll be burning the body fat and you'll be losing weight over a period of time. It is important to note that uh, in many cases, excess eating is due to habit or stress or just pure boredom. Uh, comfort eating is one more thing that we all do. Say, for example, you're having a bad day. Uh, some people have, end up having like a beer or they'll have a tub of ice cream, something like that. And the, all this adds up. I don't blame patients like that. I mean, people do have stresses in life and they do need to comfort eat. But I think it is important that we are aware of uh, or patient, people are aware of what they're putting in and, and balance it out over a period of time. Uh, a long-term weight loss study had pointed out that candidates achieving 4.5 kilograms weight reduction at six months and maintaining that at 30 months had the best reduction in blood pressure and risk for hypertension. There is a kind of, uh, there was a lecture by the Mayo Clinic once on uh, blood pressure reduction, and, and one of the points that they said was with every kilogram weight loss, you can expect a one to one and a half millimeter reduction in blood pressure. So if you lose 10 kilos, you can lose up to 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury uh, reduction in your blood pressure. So that is an excellent point to remember. That weight loss helps in reducing uh, blood pressure. This depends, of course, if you're overweight or not. But if you have a high BMI, if you lose your weight, you can definitely bring down your blood pressure. Next, next slide. So cholesterol is uh, well known. Uh, we all worry about our cholesterol mostly when we get a blood test done. The current guideline is to try and maintain uh, good uh, low levels of bad cholesterol. So. Uh, bad cholesterol is your LDL cholesterol and your triglycerides. So if you're looking at uh, keeping your heart healthy, you should be keeping your LDL cholesterol below 100 um, and your triglycerides below 150. Majority of Indians have a low HDL, which is your good cholesterol, a high LDL and a high triglyceride. And this has to do with our dietary habits since we were kids. Uh, we all want our kids to be nice and plumpy. We don't want slim, thin kids and we end up overfeeding them and all of them end up with high cholesterol in their teenage years. I've been having quite a few youngsters coming in their teenage years with high cholesterol these days. So it is a concern, of course, because those people who maintain high cholesterol, uh, say above 160 LDL, and those who don't exercise and smoke, etc., eventually are nowadays coming with heart problems, heart attacks after the age of 25 to 30. We are seeing more and more, just about a month ago, we put two or three patients in within the 40-year-old patients with, uh, underwent bypass surgery because how bad their cholesterol was. One of the ladies, uh, one of the patients who underwent bypass had an LDL of 200, which was extremely high. She had no other risk factors, but just high. And she was 41 and ended up having a bypass. So it is extremely important to try as much as possible and watch what you put in. If you eat healthily and eat lesser cholesterol, lesser, fat, lesser fatty foods, then your cholesterol can become less. But do bear in mind that genetic factors also play a role. There are patients who have parents and their parents having high cholesterol. So sometimes you will require medication to bring down the cholesterol despite your best efforts. Next slide. So if you're looking at the relationship between controlling cholesterol and heart disease, uh, a, very, a fairly robust uh, clinical review looking at 15 or independent, nearly 10 lakh patients pointed out that total cholesterol and LDL, that is your low uh, density lipoprotein cholesterol, are associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular mortality. Hazard ratio of 1.24 essentially means that the, the risk is 24% more. The HDL cholesterol was inversely associated with a risk of cardiovascular disease mortality as HDL might have properties that protect against atherosclerosis. And uh, there are, the multiple risk factor interventional trial found that uh, found an association between high serum total cholesterol levels and the incidence of ischemic stroke. So when we're treating anything where an artery gets blocked, we're always looking at bringing the cholesterol down. Next, please. Yeah, blood sugar control. We all know that diabetes is considered a cardiovascular disease equivalent. And those patients who develop diabetes, sometimes, despite their very best efforts, end up having cardiac disease or 
a stroke or a renal disease. So most patients, uh, we try, most patients who are fit and well have a fasting glucose of around 98 to 90. So keeping it below 100 fasting is a normal healthy range. Uh, these patients who have 100 to 125 uh, fasting glucose have, have got what we call pre-diabetes or at, are at increased risk of developing diabetes. And those who have a fasting glucose above 126 or a postprandial glucose above 200 or an average sugar, that is your HPA1C value is about 6.5%, are defined to have type 2 diabetes. And uh, type 2 diabetes, once you develop it, you, have, you double your risk of developing cardiac disease or you basically bring down, uh, bring the risk uh, 10 years earlier. So if you were to develop heart attack, heart disease in say 20 years time, once you develop diabetes, it can happen within 10 years. So patients have to take uh, a lot of precautions and ensure that they follow a good diet and lifestyle when it comes to managing their diabetes. Next please. So blood sugar control improves heart health. Like I mentioned that diabetes causes uh, two to three fold increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Uh, we'll talk mostly about type 2 diabetes, but once you have type 2 diabetes, uh, compared to um, um, normal population, the risk uh, mortality is seven folds higher. So patients with diabetes don't actually pass away from diabetes, they pass away from heart failure. These patients develop what you call dilated cardiomyopathy, usually diabetes related, because and you, when you do an angiogram, you find that they have very diffuse coronary disease. All the arteries are like a rat has come and bitten them, a rat nibbled appearance it is. So these arteries are all not supplying any blood to the heart so slowly the muscle dies and the heart balloons out it's what we've called an enlarged heart that is a term that is used by a lot of people and an enlarged heart can be a weak heart which can cause a lot of problems so it is important that the blood rolled well and intensive glucose lowering decreases myocardial infarction risk in addition to a reduction in the risk of diabetes and nephropathy now diabetes is a discussion on its own it is a textbook on its own. let's not talk about much about diabetes but the, the bottom line is that the better your sugar control, the uh, better the heart health will be. And you patients do require constant advice and guidance regarding their diet and what they can and cannot do with, regard, with regards to their diabetes. Medication-wise, we as doctors can handle that. But with regards to diet, sometimes the, the role of digital therapeutics is, is very, very important because patients will have tons of doubts. They may pick up a fruit one day and think, can they have that? So they can always talk to their nutritionist and find out whether that is worthwhile having or whether they risk their sugar control by having that particular fruit or, or vegetable or whatever food it is they want to eat. Next slide, please. Blood pressure control is important. Uh, we have touched upon hypertension earlier. Uh, this is the current guideline or, or the definitions of hypertension. You now, stage one hypertension is now above 130 by 80. And grade 2 hypertension is about 140-90 and hypertensive crisis is now defined as 180 by 120 and above. We have had a lot of patients come with this uh, high blood pressure that uh, we try and reduce the blood pressure as quickly as possible. The SPRINT trial that was published some years ago talked about maintaining blood pressure at 120 by 80, but not really feasible for elderly patients in India. Uh, what my current practice is, is up to the age of 65, I try and keep it around 120 to 130 by 80. 65 to 75, I go up to 140, and above 75, I keep it around 150. These patients tend to do quite well because even if you keep it at 150, the 10 year risk, you're talking about somebody 75 becoming 85. And given how modern medicine is and whatever our lifespan is, most of the people don't end up having a stroke if you keep that blood pressure well controlled uh, within 150. As long as the, the patient understands very clearly that this is what the guideline is or what they need to maintain. And that's, again, uh, it can, these facts can be reiterated by th digital therapeutics in the sense that patients may sometimes have trouble maintaining their blood pressure. And we as doctors can get information about how the patient is doing in a community and we can help them more in practice. Next, please. Uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, um, um, a fairly straightforward uh, clinical trials have found that uh, blood pressure reduction decreases cardiovascular risk by 20 to 25 percent for an MI, 35 to 40 percent for stroke, and a 50 percent uh, for heart failure. And certain medications like uh, renin angiotensin and aldosterone system antagonists are the ones that can uh, specifically low, lower cardiovascular disease uh, risk. But then you look, look, think about it, there's even beta blockers can reduce calcium channel blockers, have some benefit. Uh, prognostic benefit, but beta blockers and ACE inhibitors and ERBs, and of course, uh, your spironolactone 
these drugs have got uh, numerous uh, cardiovascular mortality benefits uh, with, reduction, with regards to heart MI and stroke. Next, please. So there are uh, uh, that have supported digital therapeutics. If you if you go on to Google Scholar on PubMed, you can find numerous papers that have talked about it. But a couple of them that have highlighted uh, specifically digital therapeutics is a study that was published in the ESC Heart Failure Journal in 2022 that found that uh, digital therapeutic rehabilitation uh, helps in adherence to treatment, improves exercise capacity and quality of life in patients with heart failure. Now, a patient with heart failure carries a 20% mortality within a year, and if they're, un if they're in uh, NYHA class 4 heart failure, that risk goes up to 50% a year. So those patients who are on uh, digital therapeutics actually can live a lot longer. Uh, other studies that have looked at uh, heart failure within India have also found that they can assist and guide patients during emergencies and have also known, been known to improve quality of life especially those of the caregivers, not the quality of life of the patients, because the caregivers have no idea what they should be doing, what they, like husbands who are heart failure, the wives worry about what to feed them, the wives who have heart failure, the husbands worry about what they can and cannot do. So these sort of questions can be said very openly and very uh, in a comfortable manner with uh, when you have a therapeutics, uh, you know, digital therapeutics backing the, the care of patients. Next, please. So yes, uh, with that, um, I'd like to wind up my discussion. Uh, just to summarize, uh, management of patients is not just clinic-based or hospital-based. It doesn't end when the patient puts their foot out of your clinic door or if they put your foot out of the hospital uh, ward. Care, we have a duty of care towards patients and we have now that will do digital therapeutics for us. They keep us in the loop, they keep us at the center of care and we are, so the patient is in the center of care. It is a bit like the Internet of Things. We have now the patient in the center. Then we have all the other facilities around the patient that can target each and every question or each and every aspect of their care. The ultimate goal of digital therapeutics is not just to provide a service, but to improve quality of life and to also uh, improve longevity of patients so they can enjoy a more fruitful and healthy life for longer. And finally, it also reduces hospital admissions. I think this is extremely important. Hospital admissions, repeated admissions is what uh, patients care. So it reduces hospital admissions. With that, I wind up my talk and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Balega. I think that was very, very comprehensive and very well explained. Uh, uh, the audience has any questions, uh, please put it in the chat box or they can unmute themselves and ask Dr. Balega. Uh, so, uh, while the audience you know, thinks of a question and puts it up, uh, one thing that I would like to ask you is, in, in practice, uh, what are the patient types where you would refer uh, digital therapeutics within the cardiovascular space? I don't think there's a... Uh, so, if you're looking at cardiovascular space, you're looking at two uh, types of patients. You're looking at non-hospitalized patients versus hospitalized patients. So, hospitalized patients are the one who get admitted with, say, pulmonary edema, heart failure, or you're looking at somebody who's had an acute coronary syndrome or a stroke. The non-hospitalized patients are the ones who are the ones who carry a high-risk profile. So they've got high blood pressure, diabetes, smoking. It's not uncommon, four or five risks. And these are the patients who are sitting ducks for developing some sort of a complication. Uh, we should try, we should be practicing more and more of preventive medicine, I feel. You know, it's all well and good to treat somebody who comes to us with a heart hospital. But if we can do what we are supposed to do as healthcare professionals, that is prevent disease then or prevent complications, I think we have done a good job. So I, I think digital therapeutics has a big role in managing uh, complicated, um, say, comorbidities, looking at hypertension, diabetes, chronic diseases, etc. Maybe also preventing admissions, but making sure quality of life is good or delaying complications. But after a patient puts their foot out of the hospital door or out of your clinic, making sure patient follows the advice that has been given to them, uh, which is extremely important because some doctors get frustrated. I personally have got frustrated numerous times where patients come and they say, oh, I thought I'll start the medication later, or I had a question about it, but I didn't want to trouble you, or I thought I'll try lifestyle changes, and they don't really do the right thing. They end up doing the wrong thing and come back worse. This has happened numerous times, or they watch a YouTube video, and then they decide that they stop all their medications without consulting us. So, these sort of things happen, and I think therapeutic companies can help a lot. Sure. I think uh, it's very well said. And 
you know, our care as as a clinician also does not stop just at the clinic, right? I think beyond yeah. the clinic, uh, care is also something that uh, they expect and I think is also required in terms of better patient outcomes. We just have to find the right medium to achieve that without them also, you know, bothering us like in every minute, mm-hmm. uh, all their questions and nor yeah. do we feel, you know, they feel left out in any way. So I think striking okay. that right balance uh, with the right approach is key and a uh, lot of take home messages for I think the audience as well and very very comprehensively explained so thank you so much uh, mm-hmm. for your time and this wonderful presentation and discussion and I also thank the audience for uh, taking out time today thank you so much everyone thank you, thank thank you. you. Thank have you. a Bye. good night thank you Bye. Bye. Bye.